Welcome to part seven of this tutorial on using AI tools. So in this tutorial, we'll look at placeholders and variables, two of the most useful topics, I think. Specifically, we'll look at using placeholders to control output, so you can make it much quicker just by giving examples to control how AI tools format the response to your prompts. We'll then look at creating variables to automate prompts so that the same prompt can serve lots of different purposes. And then we'll look at setting default values for variables so that they'll still make sense even if you don't set values for all of the parameters. And finally, we'll look at creating templates to save your fantastically useful prompts so that you can reuse them. But I think that's enough of looking at me. I'll vanish now. And let's get started. So let's suppose that you want to list the five best-selling books in the UK in the 21st century to date, and you want to show this as a bulleted list, but how to describe what form that list should be? I want the book title, the author, and the year of publication. Well, the best way to do it normally in ChatGPT or any other AI tool is to just include examples with what's called placeholders. So what I've done is used angle brackets as placeholders, and I've said I want the book title, Written, the words written by, the author name, and then in brackets, the year first publication. And this is where AI tools differ from previous software. They accept much fuzzier logic. So if you're a programmer like me, you might find this quite hard to accept initially. But because the AI uses intelligence, it will work out what to do. I'm just going to add a few words after this. Don't include any other text in your answer. And I want to say I accept your figures will be your best estimates because otherwise it will spend ages trying to justify them. So if I now try running that, you should see that after a short pause when it consults the internet, it will give me the list of books. It still included some extra text irritatingly, but it's not bad. And can you see it's done exactly what I asked it to? For each book, it's got the name of the book, the author, and then the year of release in brackets. Let's do one more example of placeholders. So this time, let's suppose we're working with Pat Smith's appraisal form. I think we saw this in a previous video. So I'll start with, please summarise the attached appraisal form for me, presenting a results like this. And then what I'm going to do is build up each bit of information. So I'll start with who it's about, because don't forget, if I work in HR, I may be seeing 50 of these a day. And so I want a very quick summary so I can have a look at it. The date range for the appraisal period. That's clearly relevant. And then what I want is a summary, so I know whether to look at it further, in at most 20 words. And finally, a rating, so that I can include that in my report. So if I try running that, hopefully, it will give me exactly the information I wanted. So although I'm not going to spend a great deal of time on placeholders, they are incredibly useful for controlling exactly how our output appears. So another form of placeholder you can use, I'm going to call variables. I'm not sure if I've actually invented this term myself. It comes from having a programming background. But here's how it works. Let's suppose you are, as it says here, an experienced advertising copywriter, and you want to think up slogans so that you can spend most of your time playing golf instead of working. So you specialize in creating catchy and persuasive slogans for clients, create a bulleted list of slogans for and then you put in the name of the product. So I eat a lot of Alpen, which is a muesli. So I'm going to put that in and it will come up with some slogans for Alpen. Weetabix, eat your heart out. The problem with that is I didn't necessarily want that many. So what I could do is go back to my prompt, which I'll just click in up here and copy. And I'm going to make a change to it. I'm going to make this a variable. Now, there's no set convention for doing that. I tend to use curly brackets like this. And then you can put a name in the curly brackets. And to make sure that it's not misinterpreted by ChatGPT or any other AI tool, I tend to use a compound word like that with underscores in. But again, you don't have to do this. I then need to supply a value for that variable. And you can get the convention from this website giving best practices for prompt engineering with OpenAI, um, is to use three hashes or three inverted commas. It doesn't matter if you don't. AI tools will forgive you anything. They're like a cat. So what I'm going to do is put those three hashes in as a separator. 
and then I'm going to provide a value for the variable or the placeholder, I guess I should call it, which I've missed out. So last time was Alpen, this time it's going to be Whiskers, which is a cat food. So if I press return, and there's some slogans. But I could take this further. So what I'll do is click and copy that, because I don't necessarily want that many slogans. So what I'm going to do, instead of saying create a bulleted list, I'll say create up to, and then in curly brackets, I'll put in another variable. Let's call it number slogans. And I should say create a bulleted list of, make it work. So now I can try running that, but I also need to include down here, and it doesn't matter what order I put this in, my value for my second variable, which is number slogans. So let's say I want just three slogans, and being bored of whiskers, let's put um, apple. See what it can come up with that, for that. And if I run that, I get three slogans. And as I hope you'll appreciate, the beauty of this approach is that you can then take this prompt and use it again and again and again. And instead of having to type everything out, all you have to do is change the value of the two variables you've included. So let's do one more example. I'm going to create another new chat. And this time I want you to suppose that you are writing blogs. And this is a real life example I did because I do often blog for our newsletter. So the variables I want to set are, I want you to give me no more than idea count ideas for a blog on, and then I can change the subject. Present your response as a table with two headings, idea and notes. Each note should contain no more than that many words. Use clear and concise English and avoid jargon or filler text. That's a bit of a standard thing to include in any prompt. The style you should aim for is blog style. So I've got four different variables I need to provide values for. So what I can now do is to set values for each of those four variables. So that's what I'll do now. So let's, I think five ideas will probably be enough for me. The subject in which I'm going to invite blogs on is playing squash, just because it's something I do a lot of. I think 20 words on that will be sufficient for a summary. And the style should be, what should we go for, enthusiastic. And you'll notice I haven't been particularly consistent with my inverted commas. I've included them around the subject, but not around the style. And the great thing about artificial intelligence is it just won't mind. It accepts pretty much anything I found. So if I now try running that, I should get five ideas on blogs on playing squash in an enthusiastic style. But if I were then to run exactly the same prompt, but this time, if I put completely different values for my variables, so just need to separate this out, which is always slightly annoying. So what I'll do is say I want three ideas. So the subject of the blog can be searching for ancient artifacts, a subject about which I know virtually nothing. I think we allow 30 words for that, for the summary of each. And let's go for the style as being pedantic and humorous. Not quite sure what I'm going to get as a result of this. If I try running that now, it will give me some blog ideas and things which I definitely wouldn't want to read. So again, you can see this is a prompt I could easily reuse to produce lists of blogs on lots and lots of different subjects in different styles of different length. If you like variables, and I very much hope you will, I think they're great, then you can extend them by providing default values for missed out variables. So here I've got a very short prompt saying write a something about something in something. And what I could do is choose to provide all three parts of this. So let's say I want a limerick. Uh, I want it about, or should we have it about, painting fences. And I will choose English. If, I think if I miss the language out, English is the one I will get by default. And if I run that query, or that prompt, you'll see I get what I asked for. And very good it is too. But what would happen if I wanted to miss some things out? I could get around this by adding in extra text like this. So here I've said, if I don't mention a subject, I want you to write about the lyrics of Kate Bush songs. I had to choose something. If I don't mention a language, I want you to write in French. 
And if I don't say what you want to write about, I'll get not more than 20 words in free format text. So if I leave this exactly as I've got it here, I should get 20 words in free format text in French about Kate Bush. And I'm guessing that is what I've got. What I could then do is go back to my prompt and copy and paste it. And this time I could say something about it. So I'm going to say I want a limerick and I'm going to change the language to English, but I'll keep everything else. So what I should get is a limerick in English, but it should still be about Kate Bush, and indeed it is. So I'm really hoping on watching this section on variables and on placeholders that you think how incredibly useful it would be to have a list of standard prompts that you could reuse. Well, here's an idea for doing that. I've got a Word document. It's only got one prompt in so far, but I'm intending to add to it. And this is a prompt for sending an email. So rather than keep having to reinvent the same wheel all the time, I can just take this and copy it into my chat GPT or whatever AI tool I'm using. So it gives me instructions for sending an email. Create an email to this person with this subject using this email address. And then it gives some useful background information on how I want to write most of my emails. So I'm assuming I'm a trainer and web developer for a small B2B computer training company in the UK. And my style is to use clear, concise English, I hope, without jargon or filler words, and with a light and easy to read style with humor where, where possible. You may, you may disagree with that. And then the actual text of the email. So what I now need to do is to fill in the details. So what I'm going to do is say I'm writing to Bob. I'll put the email address as bob at wisel.co.uk. Bob is fictitious, but never mind. The subject is stop stealing my milk, which should give you some idea of what I'm writing about. And I'll put the details of the email is to say, please, can you stop drinking my milk from the fridge? So if I now run that, you should see it will generate a draft email. <laughs> and it says this is a delicate matter, but my milk seems to develop legs and keeps walking out of the fridge. I'm fairly sure it isn't down to paranormal activity. I'll be proud to send this email. So what I would encourage you to do is to create your own bank of standard emails in that format. And you could include an extra column as I've done, giving a list of the variables and what information you should provide for them. There's so much more on our website at wiseowl.co.uk, including blogs, shorter tips, tutorials on SQL and VBA, hundreds of exercises in all sorts of different software applications, and a chance to test your skills in a few selected software applications. In addition to all of that, you can watch our video tutorials like this one in all these different subjects. Or you could consider booking one of our training courses, whether it be classroom, on-site or online, or even as one-to-one -one consultancy. Thank you for watching.